Hey, how's it going? Welcome to the YouTube Live. I just turned on the polls. If people want to put their names in the polls, go for it. And I even was able to code up some warm-up questions, and those will be fun. Hopefully the internet will behave. And right after this, I will try to buy a new router. And that will probably help. Welcome. Glad to see you on here so quickly. Good job. And I'll be getting my book out and get ready to ask some sweet questions. As usual, what's the temperature in the College of Math Live room? Let's see. Uh, well, we got like 50, 51 degrees. Come on. Come on. I see it's sunny outside. It's warmer outside than it is in here. <laughs> Oh, that's okay. I'll hit the sunshine after this. You gotta do the math first. That that makes the sunshine feel even better when all your math is done first. Yeah. All right, get your math book right here. Welcome, everybody. And if you would like, you can look on the YouTube live page on our Canvas site, and you can see the two warm-up questions that I have prepared. And I'll start doing those in a couple minutes. Once we get about 10 people in the room, I think that's the usual amount. All right, welcome everybody. We got seven viewers now. Maybe I'll just give it one or two more minutes. Go ahead and get yourself a snack or something. Get ready for our fun YouTube live. Trying to get all my stuff to load here. I hope that you can see the two clickable image questions that I have prepared for us. For me, it says image loading. And so I don't know if it actually went through when I uploaded those images. I was trying to make a couple helpful warm up questions. Well, one of them has a screenshot from me using Desmos, and the other one has a screenshot from me using um, that, on -live, <clears throat> that online differential equation solver that we were doing when we were exploring vector fields. Remember, I gave you that really cool vector field plotter online, and for me, the second image is not loading, and I'm concerned that it may never have loaded, and... Uh, I just don't know. Oh, they loaded. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that, being able to hear back from you. Okay, so that wasn't just me. So as funny, I may not be able to see your answer to that second one if it never loads, but I'm glad to know that the students can see it. And uh, yeah, I might even have to ask you what people answered because my internet's so bad that it's not loading on me. Anyway. We'll make it work. That is like the theme for this spring, I think, is that we're going to make it work no matter what happens. So let's do it. You can see them. but Oh, okay. So somebody is telling me that they see this uh, thing that says it wants you to accept cookies and it's not allowing you to say yes. And now this is the second time I've heard that from a student. And I don't know how to solve that problem. But what I suggested to the other person who said that was try another browser. And the other suggestion I thought of was to um, try to up, try to um, what do they call it? Update your browser, but you probably don't want to try to update your browser right now. 
If you could try to view the Canvas page in another browser, I would hope that um, it would get rid of that little thing that says accept cookies and it's kind of blocking the results. I'm sorry, that that is very frustrating, but I, I don't know how to solve it. If anybody else knows how to solve it, then um, please type it in there. If anybody else knows about this issue of having a message that says it needs to accept cookies in front of your results and then not being able to actually view the results because it's behind the message. I don't know. I wish I knew though. So also if you do end up solving it, if you could let me know, then I will broadcast the solution to anyone else who, who encounters that issue and who needs to know how to solve it. That will be great. Hope we can get that solved out. And it seems to only happen when I do clickable images. Um, I'm going to go on to our first clickable image now. And um, for this one is a warm up question. Can you? Oh, OK. So some people have an issue where on the poll results on the Canvas page that shows the poll results, it says, um, can you please accept cookies? And it has like this big box in front of the clickable image that says accept cookies. And you try to click yes, but then it does doesn't make the message go away. And so you can't see the image. Oh, another thing that I just thought of that might work is try to resize your browser. Because I noticed that on mine, when I'm looking at the word clouds, if my browser window itself is too small, then the word cloud doesn't show up correctly. So that's just another quick thing that you could try is just kind of play with it and like resize your browser to see if you could at least move the message around so that you can see um, the, the image. Someone else is saying that they can't see the question. And maybe you can't see the question because you're looking at the um, the live poll questions link. And I have not made the question active yet. I'm going to make the question active now. And then I'll see if that helps. OK, so here we go. I'm making the question active. The question says, click where you see a stable equilibrium point. Usually, I would try to hide the responses until people are able to enter theirs in, but ugh, my internet is so slow that I cannot manipulate the question. It took me 30 seconds to activate it. This is very frustrating. If you're in the Zoom today, then you know about this problem. I just announced it. My internet is just crawling like a snail. And um, I think I'm gonna try to run to the Best Buy or something, see if I can get a new router, because this is not a sustainable way to teach online. But um, hang in there for today, and uh, hopefully we won't have this. Oh, here it goes. OK, so I'm going to hide the responses for a minute to give people a chance to respond without being influenced by what they see as um, others' responses. So go ahead and, uh, yeah, so somebody is recommending trying different browsers, Firefox, Chrome, Internet Explorer, Safari. There's so many different ones, and hopefully we can all find something that works for us. And um, yeah, I'm going to put on the uh, results here just in a second. I'm just seeing how many results. So we have eight people responding so far on this first warm up question. Again, the warm up question is click where you see a stable equilibrium point. All good. OK, cool, cool. All right, good. So hopefully everyone's able to participate. And um, if you're someone who's uh, starting to do this, Keep in mind that you need to click on the live poll questions link in order to submit your answer. It's like there's there's the Canvas page where you can just see the results that are coming in. But if you want to play along with us, then on that same Canvas page where you see the results, go up to the top where it says to participate. There are two links involved. And that second link is um, the one where you can play along and you can respond. And I'm glad to know that it looks like the live stream is working and that's really great. You know, it's funny because some websites are going fine. Like I was able to do streaming Zoom and streaming YouTube Live, but when I just try to go to like my.evergreen.edu, I, I just can't go. Like it doesn't ever load. Same thing for gmail.com, it just doesn't load. And so I've been telling students that, but. I'll say it on here too. If you're trying to communicate with me right now, the only means of communication that's able to load for me right now is Canvas. And so send me a Canvas message. Do not email me at my usual email address right now because I can't unlock my email. And I feel like it's my issue 
but I will be troubleshooting when I get out of here for the rest of the day to try to solve it because who knows what kind of messages I have in there. I'm sorry if I haven't responded to your email in the last two days. This has been happening for me for about two days, but it should get solved soon. And I see that we have nine respondents here on my first poll that says click where you see a stable point. Um, if anybody else wants to respond before I show the results, go ahead and do so. And uh, I'd like you to know that um, when we do these first two questions, you're going to notice that both of the questions say click where you see a stable equilibrium. But what's different about these two questions is this first one is giving you a graph of X prime versus X. And the second one is a graph of X versus time. OK, and so you really want to pay attention to what's being graphed on the two axes when you answer a question like that, because the point of these two warm ups is that equilibrium points look different depending on what we're graphing. So we really have to pay attention to what we're graphing. That's why I put the labels on the graph there for this graph that's currently up. The X axis is the state and the Y axis is the rate of change. And uh, thank you again for the comments in the live chat. I did try plugging in this morning um, with the Ethernet cable, and it didn't strangely seem to make a difference. And that's why I think that my real issue is my router. But I'm glad that some people are solving their problems simply by connecting with a cable. That's great. Let's see the responses, see where people think there's a stable equilibrium point in this system. There we go. Great. So now you can see if you're looking at the Canvas page, you can see that all the dots there have showed up. And the um, out of nine responses, the main cloud of responses is um, around the root of that equation where it's intersecting the x-axis a little over 11. And that's correct. That is a staple equilibrium point. And I see someone else has responded by clicking on z the zero root. And you are correct that that is also an equilibrium point. But remember about linear stability theory, too, because, I mean, you you recognize an equilibrium point. That's good. But this question was subtle in that it had uh, many nuanced layers. One was, where's the equilibrium point? The other is, where's the stable one? And so the one at zero, zero is actually an unstable one. And the one that's a little bit over 11 is the stable one. I'm going to write that on the board because I want to make sure that, that that's a really part, important part of this week's learning. I want to make sure that that's coming through clear, crystal clear. OK, so again, what we're talking about here is on this type of graph, this is an x is x prime graph. OK, because there's two different types of graphs for this week, and we have to really focus on the difference. So this is an x versus x prime. Remember that in our study of autonomous differential equations, x prime is equal to some function of x itself. So that's why I'm writing x prime equals f of x. So you could have either labeled the y-axis as f of x or as x prime. And here we see a graph that corresponds to further exercise 3.2.4 that looks like this. It's, it looks parabolic, but it's actually not symmetric like a parabola. It's kind of tilted a little bit more over here. One of the things that I really wanted to highlight with this warm-up question is that you can do this too. And that's what we're going to be practicing when we get into next week is we're going to kind of go through what we've done so far and what we can do with it. And so take a good look at this clickable image and look at what I did in Desmos. And then take a look at your homework. Your homework exercise, further exercise 3.2.4, gives you this equation. It's kind of complicated, kind of scary looking. But I want you to notice that I typed that straight into Desmos. And I even typed it in with the parameters, the K. I used A instead of alpha and even the X naught. And when you do type things into Desmos like that, every time you type in a letter that's not X, it'll ask you, do you want to add a slider? And you just click yes, add sliders. And that's where you can see I have all those little sliders there. And so I'm not only able to visualize the function in the exercise that's being assigned, but I'm also able to manipulate it and see how that function changes with respect to all of the parameters. So it's really nice. And you definitely can do that too. I wanted you to know that by providing this example for you. Um, and then just to talk a little bit about the fixed points and the stability of them, you were right to pick out that there's a fixed point there at that root and there's a fixed point there at the other root. 
sorry, sometimes I call them fixed points because that's what they're called in other books. But they're also called equilibrium points. Okay, so on this type of graph, the equilibrium points are located at the roots, the roots or the zeros of f of x. Right, because we're setting f of x equal to zero. So the values of x such that f of x equals to zero represent the equilibrium points on the x versus x prime graph. The other thing that we need to answer this question is knowledge about linear stability theory, which I've been consistently drawing uh, linear approximations with my red pen. So linear stability theory tells us that we are going to look at the tangent line at this fixed point, right? And so that's the same thing as evaluating df dx at the fixed point right there. And that evaluated at that fixed point has a negative slope. That's what we learned in section 3.2 this week that tells us that this is a stable fixed point because the derivative df dx, not dx dt, df dx evaluated at this fixed point is less than zero. That's what makes this a stable fixed point. The other thing that we learned about from linear stability theory was that if we evaluate df dx and we get something that's greater than zero, like over here, we see df dx being positively sloped. And if that's true, then that means that this is an unstable fixed point. So this one right here is an unstable fixed point, and the one to the right is a stable fixed point. So that's why most people were correctly responding with this fixed point as opposed to that fixed point. But it's great to see that everybody is starting to associate the fixed, the equilibrium points of um, a differential equation with the roots of the function f of x. It's very important. Okay, so let's just do one more warm up question. And I feel like I'm gonna need your help with this one because that image is just not loading for me. I'm glad to know it's loading for you. Um, I'll try to get it to load on my side, um, maybe through the Poll Everywhere software as opposed to Canvas because uh, otherwise I won't be able to see results. But I just turned on the second question and hopefully you really appreciate that this is the same thing in a different way. Okay, and it's using exactly the two internet tools that we had focused on earlier in the quarter, around weeks three and four. Remember, I introduced us to the tool of Desmos, and they also introduced us to the tool of the vector field plotter. And we're gonna be going back to those tools quite a bit. Those are basically what we're gonna be using to analyze differential equations, in, in addition to the theory that we're learning in the book. So a lot of your homework assignments for next week are having you use these same exact tools. So that's why I thought it would be good to uh, get you nice and comfy with them here. I can't see the results. This is such a bummer. I see that four people have entered something, but I can't see what it is. So um, I'll draw what I know that I graphed as the answer. And I'll give it away in a second, I guess. Um, sure wish I could see what you all were clicking on, but uh, yeah, it's just not happening for me. Okay, so all I can see is that your results are loading. So I'm glad to see, know that you're participating. We have seven respondents so far, um, but I, I'm not able to... I can't hide or um, see the responses myself. Um, so maybe I'll just wait a little longer and I'll just explain what I was drawing and what the answer is. And then, uh, well, you know, you can see if you got it right. Okay, so the second one here is gonna be a time graph. So that's what I'm drawing. It's the same problem. It's the same further exercise right now these warm-up questions are further exercise 3.2.4. It's the same problem. And you see, if you're looking at the image and you're able to see the image load, then you can see that the slider parameters that I used in Desmos are the same parameters that I typed into the phase plane plotter. And I'm in the one ODE tab. And remember in the one ODE tab, when you see an X and Y axis, what that is plotting is it's plotting time on the horizontal axis 
and it's plotting the state x on the vertical axis. And these are the two different graphs that we were talking about. This is a time series version as opposed to the x versus x prime graph. Okay, but it's the same thing that this is trying to tell me. And where this told me that there is a stable equilibrium right here, that equilibrium was occurring a little bit greater than 11. And how does that look on a time graph? Again, I'm sorry, I can't. Oh, wait, wait, it just loaded. Oh, yay. Okay, good, good. And you're all, most, most answers are clicking exactly where I wanted you to click. That's fantastic. Okay, so you see where this is right here, like, if you look at the Desmos picture, you'll see that the number 11 was right here. So this stable equilibrium was a little bit greater than 11. On a time graph, like I made that video of yesterday, equilibria look like horizontal lines. And that's a horizontal line whose height is just a little bit above 11. And this right here is the stable equilibria. Right, that's the same stable equilibrium point that we saw right there appearing now on a time series graph as a horizontal line. And then what I did, that's the blue line. What I did with the green and red lines was I showed you some other initial conditions that represent trajectories or solutions that are not the equilibrium point. And so you can see there's one trajectory that looks like this, another trajectory that looks like this, if I start with a lower initial condition, all solutions will be approaching equilibrium. So I don't want you to mistakenly think that these are um, topping off somewhere less than equilibrium. They are actually asymptotically approaching the equilibrium point, but never quite getting there. And that's because the order, um, or I should say, uh, the manner of the approach towards equilibrium for any other initial condition is one of exponential decay. And that has to do with the fact that the linearity principle we talked about before um, states that this differential equation will act like a linear differential equation very close to the fixed point. So if I zoomed in on this stable fixed point really closely, I would basically be seeing a system that looks like the linear system x prime is equal to rx with r less than zero. That's why the df dx less than zero is what corresponds to stable, because the linear system x prime equals rx with x less than uh, with r less than zero is stable. So we have an exponential decay rate towards the stable equilibrium point. Other initial conditions never quite make it to the actual equilibrium value, but they approach it in a manner that looks like exponential decay for all time. Which is to say that if I looked at just at this part of the graph, this line looks like e to the minus x as it horizontally asymptotes towards zero. But in this case, we have initial conditions horizontally asymptoting towards the stable equilibrium. Great, hopefully that was really helpful for your learning. And that was just a warm up. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the request brainstorm for things that people would like to see. And then I'll leave that open for about two or three minutes, give it a little time to populate. And then I will go uh, straight for the open chat space so you can start providing me with some feedback. Trying to turn on the poll right now, but I got some lag here. Come on. Okay. All right. Great. So I got it on. And so go ahead and fill it up with all your requests. I'll give you a two or three minutes to do that. And then I'm going to switch it over to the open chat space so that we can talk um, while I answer the questions. And uh, you can just throw in there a request for a problem, or you can throw in there a request for me to elaborate on a concept um, or explain any page. Go ahead and just throw in any question that you would have. Um, if you want to give a suggestion for a question, once they start coming in, you can just vote things up or down and be able to contribute that way so that um, I know how many people are really wanting to know that thing. Yeah, and um, I see 3.2.10 and further 3.2.10, and that just reminds me 
to remind you to please make sure that you specify further if you mean a further exercise. Um, I'm taking that, what I see there to mean that you want both 3.2.10 in the textbook, and then you also want the blue exercise, further 3.2.10. So happy to cover both of those for you. Nice. Okay, great. I love that question, 3.2.10. That's it. got a good lesson in it that I had not emphasized yet. So definitely let's go for that. And then I'll see what further exercise 3.2.10 is. Papers in here. Um, oh, yeah, right. I want to get into further exercise 3.2.10, but I might save the further exercise for more towards the end because um, that's actually the further exercise 3.2.10 is a precursor for our learning of bifurcations. So excited to talk about that. Wanna make sure everybody is solid on everything in 3.2 so far before we move on to an extension of the concept like you see hinted at in further 3.2.10. Then we also have requests for 3.2.12 and further 3.2.2. Great. Hopefully the little warm up helped you with 3.2.4. And uh, last chance to put in your request. So go ahead, if you haven't put in a request yet, but you're hesitating and thinking, maybe I kind of want to get that on there. Uh, I'm going to leave up this poll for about one more minute and then I'm going to switch it over to the open chat space to give you a place to um, talk back to me. Um, so I just want you to know this poll is not going to stay open forever. So throw your questions in now. Also, once I open up the open chat space, you can always put a request in that way as well. Um, but this is what I work with as the running list of requests is whatever comes into this. Okay, so 3.2.12 will lead us back into the LE effect, and we can choose some specific parameters for the LE effect and um, get into that in more detail. And actually, 3.2.8 is again the LE effect. Um, great. So actually, you know what? 3.2.8 and 3.2.12 are actually pretty much the same question, except in 3.2.12, you're allowed to pick your own values for R and K and A. So to address those two as a pair, I think I will do out 3.2.8 and then let you, you let you practice it again with your own choice of parameters for 3.2.12. Uh, 3.2.2. Draw phase portraits to confirm each of the above statements. Great, we should probably do that. And I will explain what 3.2.2 is saying. And then we have further exercise seven. Right. Cool, I love that further exercise seven. That's, that's a really fun one because it allows us to be creative um, and sketch the graphs of any functions we want, um, kind of bouncing off of what we learned from figure 3.7. So great, a uh, nice list of stuff, a lot of learning opportunities here. I'm gonna go ahead and switch out to the open chat space now, and um, let's use that as our conversation place. And if that leads to more questions being asked, I'm perfectly fine with that too. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what you've entered so far and I'm going to go through it in the chronological order of the book um, because it helps with the learning that way. The learning. <laughs> okay, so we're going to start with 3.2.2 on page 119. That was kind of the first request in orders. 3.2.2 number uh, page 119 and on page 119 it says draw face portraits to confirm each of the above statements so I would like to just read the statements a little bit and if you have the book go to page 119 and read along with me um, what it says is an equilibrium point is stable 
if the vector field would move the system back to equilibrium if it was nudged off. If the vector field would carry the system away from the equilibrium point, then the equilibrium point is unstable. If vectors on one side of the equilibrium point uh, toward it and those on the other side point away from it, then we say the equilibrium is semi-stable. Semi-stability is an unusual situation that places actually do occur. They're very special, but the reason that they occur is because a system is going through a bifurcation usually. And so we will actually return, we'll go full, full circle from starting with classifying equilibria and their phase portraits in exercise 3.2.2. By the time we get to further exercise 3.2.10, at the end of this session, we will return to the question of semi-stability and see it as a look ahead into our study of bifurcations later in the quarter in section 3.6. Really nice set that you've chosen. Thank you very much for your input. And let's get started. I'm going to pull over a table. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw some phase portraits so that we can classify stable, unstable, and semi-stable fixed points. I'll draw one phase portrait for each of those different cases. Those are the different types of stability in one dimension. Next week when we do section 3.3, we're going to see all the types of fixed points that can occur in two dimensions. So it gets really interesting. But what we're going to learn there is an extension of what we learn here. So make sure that we really understand it. Throw your questions into the chat box if you have any questions. So these are types of equilibrium points in one dimension. Okay, we talked a lot about this. And as the book is saying, there's three types. There's stable. There's unstable. And then they're semi-stable, okay? And I'm just gonna draw a little face portrait for each of them. So we're in one dimension. Keep that in mind as you see me drawing a one-dimensional line because there's only one state dimension, the phase space for that one dimension, oh, sorry, the state space, also known as a phase space in many literature, um, is only one-dimensional, okay? And I'm going to represent an equilibrium point for each of these categories with just a dot. So here's the equilibrium. Here's this unstable equilibrium. Here's a semi-stable equilibrium. So far, they all look like the same thing. But the exercise says, draw phase portraits to confirm the statements, where the statements are describing the movement toward or away from the equilibrium point for nearby initial conditions. And really, the behavior of nearby initial conditions is what defines each of these equilibria as one of these three descriptors. In a stable case, what the book is saying is that if you start nearby, so you are not starting right on this point, but you're starting maybe a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left of that point, you're going to move towards the fixed point. So all arrows are saying, come back to the stable fixed point. That is, by definition, what's making it stable, is that nearby initial conditions or perturbations from the equilibria are being attracted back to that stable fixed point. So sometimes that's called an attractor. That's called an attractor. Because things are being attracted to it. Makes sense, right? Then unstable is the exact opposite of that, where things want to move away from it. So if I start over here, then the vector field, the one-dimensional vector field, is going to be um, positive and tell me, get away from that point. Or if I start over here, the vector field will be negative, and again, it would tell me, get away from that point. And so it's re repelling nearby initial conditions. Sometimes we call that repeller. Repeller? I don't know how to spell that. I'm not a good speller. I don't know how to spell repeller, but I am okay with rhymes. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea, right? Either things are coming towards it or they're getting kicked away from it. And then the only last possible thing that could happen was, would be semi-stable in which it's attracting, attracting nearby trajectories from one side 
and repelling them from the other side. And so kind of make a, two arrows that look like that. Okay, so that's one case. Semi-stable might actually have two different phase portraits because we could have stability from the left and instability to the right or vice versa. We could have stability coming in from the right and instability going out from the left. So both of these things count as semi-stable, okay? And really, semi-stable equilibrium points, they are basically unstable. Basically unstable. Um, I'm just going to add that in because I want you to know that any little bit of instability spoils the soup. Okay, if we really want to talk about something, like let's say that we're building a rocket ship that we want to go to Mars, or uh, we're trying to trial a new drug where we want to bring a patient back into a healthy homeostasis. If we want something that's going to behave stably, we better have stable behavior surrounding that fixed point, surrounding it in all dimensions. That's going to actually make it nice and stable. If we have any type of instability just on one side, that's really going to screw things up when you start to consider fluctuations, stochastic noise built in, where, you know, I might be near the fixed point, but I don't really know what side of it I'm on. And if there's one side that's unstable, like in the semi-stable case, that is making it unstable. So that's why I'm saying it's basically unstable because it's not, in practice, going to help you do anything worthwhile because there's a possibility of unstable behavior here in this part and in that part and so you just got to watch out for that okay um i'll also maybe give you a little bonus and i'll show you how those things might combine okay and so these things can be all together you might have a phase plane that has a lot of different fixed points on it okay so here is some sort of differential equation that yields four different roots for f of x. So we have four different phase planes, uh, sorry, four different equilibrium points. Um, and one of those might be stable. And then the next one might be unstable. And then again, one of them might be stable and the next one might be unstable, okay? Now I'm gonna mark these equilibrium points with numbers and I'm gonna ask you in the chat box, to classify for me whether the equilibrium points I mark are stable or unstable, okay? Because I want to make sure that people are really playing along. So let's call this one, two, three, four. And I want you to type this into the chat space. Out of the four equilibria marked one, two, three, and four, which are stable? Which equilibrium points are stable? And which ones are unstable? I'm going to get a little participation going. Nice, people are watching. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I'm seeing some people marking number one as stable, right? And number three is also stable, right? And number two and four are unstable. Excellent job. Great, great. Okay, totally got it. Great. So now we'll move on to the next question. So numbers one and three are stable. And numbers two and four are unstable. Now, before I move away from this question, I just want to give you a little, a little mention to something that I assigned, which is very interesting theoretically. Um, if you go over to further exercise number seven on page 132, the question of further exercise number seven says, is it possible for a one-dimensional system to have two stable equilibria next to each other without a stable one in between? And I just want to get kind of your read on this, because this is a yes or no. Of course, for further exercise number seven, you will have to explain yourself. But I just want to get a quick read from the class. Further exercise number seven? Is the answer yes or no? Is it possible to have two stable equilibria next to each other? So can we have two stable equilibrium points next to each other? That means 
without an unstable one in between. That's just a quickie I want to propose for you. And for right now, we'll talk about either yes or no answer. Um, that's further exercise number seven. Wasn't on the list, but maybe it's not on your radar yet. But this actually, this picture kind of answers the question a little bit. So I just throw it in there for a bonus. Oopsies. 3.2. Two people so far say no. We got any takers for yes? It will be tough to draw. It might actually be literally impossible to draw two stable equilibrium next to each other. Now, how the heck would I draw two stable equilibrium next to each other when, as you just saw, like, let's just focus on number one here. For number one to be stable, everything has to be pointing towards it in both directions, right? But if things are pointing towards one from this side, that means they must be pointing away from whatever's the next equilibrium point next to it, right? There's no way for one and two to be stable at the same time because for two to be stable, I would need the vector field to be pointing towards it. But you'll notice that in each of the um, in between, so in between one and two, in between two and three, in between three and four, you always just have one arrow. You can't have two different types of arrows in between the roots. That would be the same thing that as saying that a continuous function could change its sign without passing through zero. And we all know that's not true. How are you going to draw a continuous function going from positive to negative without going through zero, right? Right, because it changed direction, it has to go through zero. No, but there could be a stable, semi-stable one in between. That's another good point. I could have a situation like this where I have a stable one, and then this one over here is semi-stable, right? So that is possible to have set stable next to semi-stable, but you'll notice that the unstable half of this semi-stable equilibrium is exactly the same piece that's pointing towards the stable equilibrium. So there's no way, it, it would be pulling things in two different directions. Basically just said the answer for their exercise number seven, and you can just keep that for later. Cool. Um, now let's move through the list here. Oh, wait, actually, that did get on there. Okay, so somebody had asked for further exercise number seven. I hope that clears it up. Um, if that didn't clear up further exercise number seven, um, please enter any remaining questions into the box. As I start to look through the book and decide what next question to tackle, I will also be looking in the open chat space for any remaining questions about FE number seven. All right, let's see. Next thing on your list chronologically would be number eight, exercise 3.2.8. Oh, nice. Let's get into the Ali effect. Now, I don't see anybody asking any questions uh, left about what we have on the board here. So if we're okay, I'm going to now erase everything. And we are going to hop to page 123. And we're going to talk about exercise 3.2.8 knowing that the same thing I'm about to do for number eight is what you will do for number 10, but y'all just choose different numbers. Yeah, so this was our new ecological concept for this week, was starting to talk about the Ali effect. And exercise 3.2.8 gives us a differential equation that has the form of the Ali effect with R is equal to 0.1, K is equal to 1,000, and A is equal to 50. Population N's rate of change is equal to 0.1 N. Oopsies. 
And one minus n over a thousand times n over 50 minus one. Okay, and so these are the parameters. R equals 0 0.1, k is equal to a thousand, right here, a is equal to 50. And so what I'm gonna say for those who requested 3.2.10, that this is the same thing, oh, sorry, uh, 3.2.12. I saw a request on there for 3.2.12. So repeat 3.2.12 the same way, but with your own choice of numbers. Your own choice for R, K, and A. Okay, so we're going to be... Uh, getting two birds with one stone, I guess. So let's get going. Whenever I have a one-dimensional autonomous equation to work with, the very first thing that I want to do is graph the x versus x prime graph. That tells you all the information, and then you can interpret it into a time series graph after that. Okay, so that is your best bet for your first move is to graph that. Now, if you really want to be active and try this out right now while you're watching me you could pop open a tab in desmos and you could graph that sucker just how it's defined right there just use the letter x instead of n and just type that into desmos so that's one suggestion if you want to play along right now is you can type this equation into desmos and see what a graph of it looks like and i will do my best to graph it not to scale um on my own Knowing what I know from pre-calculus about polynomials, here I'm observing a factored cubic polynomial. And because it's factored out where it has one, two, three factors, I know that the roots will occur at the zeros of each factor. So I know there's gonna be a root at zero, there's gonna be a root at 1,000, and there's gonna be a root at 50. The other thing that I need to know before graphing this polynomial is, um, the long-term behavior in terms of the sign of the leading order coefficient. Do you remember all that <laughs> from pre-calculus, right? So if I was going to actually um, type this all out in its unfactored form, what I'm trying to say is, what would the coefficient that's multiplying the n cubed term be? Would it be a positive coefficient or would it be a negative coefficient? Because that's going to tell me whether I should draw it like this or whether I should draw it like this. Okay, and so when I look at this, and I do this times this times this, I see that the cubic term has a negative coefficient. And that's what tells me that this is going to look like that. Okay, and so here, I mean, really, it's going to look like, because remember what we learned about polynomials and their long-term behavior in pre-calc is that that long-term behavior is defined by the sign of the leading order coefficient. So being negative, that means that I'll be going to positive infinity in the negative territory and uh, negative infinity in the positive territory. And that leaves me with three zeros, one at zero, one at 50, and one at 1,000. That's why I was saying that I'm not doing this to scale because 50 and 1,000 are a lot farther apart than 0 and 50 are, as you can see on mine. But if you are playing along and typing this into Desmos, you have to use the settings and make sure that you change the x-axis so that it goes from 0 all the way to 1,000 to make sure that you see that third root. You should make the x-axis go past 1,000. Okay, cool. So let's get on with trying to match up what we just talked about in terms of face lines with what we're observing right here. Um, I'm assuming, yeah, right. It says, oh, it says linear stability. Oh, 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 okay. So I was just telling you how I do Diffie Qs, but the book says use linear stability analysis to find the stability, then use the graphical method to check your results. I always graph stuff right off the bat. I'm not gonna do algebra before graphing if I can help it because I'm a visual learner and I wanna see what I'm talking about when I'm going through all that mumbo jumbo with the algebra. So I'm doing the graphical method first because it's the funnest way to visualize what's happening and then we will supplement that with the algebra that has us take DFDN and evaluate it at the fixed points. We'll do that too. 
Don't worry, Ellen. We'll do them both. I just like pictures, okay? So I'm going to do the pictures first. Okay. Remember when I just drew all those phase lines and I was doing like arrows pointing towards or arrows pointing away? Let me show you how to get that out of this picture, okay? Because really what I'm looking at is the N axis, the horizontal axis here is actually showing me the phase line. The phase line for N is the horizontal axis. So I'm just going to copy my equilibrium points straight down onto this axis. Just because I want to show you, this is what we were just drawing um, before I erased the board. And I want to show you how you can look at this and you can see this from it. Okay? The pictures do, yeah, right. Like the picture is worth a thousand algebras. So, like, not just going to go for that. Okay. Thanks for the comment. Um, how are we going to know which way to point the arrows on this thing? Remember, we just talked about pointing the arrows? We're just going to see what the output is here because the output or what's being graphed on the vertical axis is the rate of change n. And so if the rate of change is a positive amount, that means that the behavior for my state n is one where it's increasing. You see how I got that? Because this graph is outputting positive numbers, that means that I should be pointing towards the positive direction on the phase line. So that's how you get it, right off the graph. Okay, down here in this region between 0 and 50, the output for n prime, the value of n prime, is a negative amount. And what negative amounts mean is it means move to the left. And so that's how I get moved to the left right there. And then likewise over here, being above the x-axis, all of these positive values tell me that I'm moving in the positive direction. So they're all moving like this. Now, I know this is a hump, and a lot of people have been asking me this week for very good reasons. What's the significance of this top point of the hump? This is very significant, and we're going to talk about this more as we move towards bifurcation theory. But for now, to match it up with the concept of me drawing this arrow, because the output, the rate of change n prime, is very positive here, that's a big arrow. But if I'm over here, where the output is positive, but it's not as positive, maybe if I wanted to show you the magnitude of these vectors, I might draw a smaller arrow, right? Because it's moving to the right here, but it's moving at a slower rate than it is here. And then it's moving at a bigger rate and a bigger rate. And then right here, this is where n prime is at its maximum value. So that means that n, n is increasing fastest. right here. That's the interpretation. Because what the, what the vertical axis is telling us is how fast is that rate going, OK? So if I was going to look at a time series, you would see that uh, the tangent lines to the solution have their maximum slope. It's moving maximally fast right here. And then after we, get, after we go past this max, it's still moving to the right. It's just not moving as fast, you see, and it gets slower and slower and slower. And then as we approach the um, as we approach this stable fixed point right here, you see the rate of change gets slower and slower and slower. And that's the irony. That's where the Zeno's paradox is. Because solutions want to go to equilibrium, but they never quite make it there. Because the closer they get to the equilibrium point, the slower the rate of change is. And so it's just like, oh, I just really want to get there. But every time I step, take a step closer, I'm going half the distance toward it, right? Remember Zeno's paradox? You're always taking a step that's half the distance to your goal, half the distance to your goal. Your rate of change slows down as it approaches the fixed point. And so that's why it never quite makes it there. It's just asymptotically approaching it at an exponentially decreasing rate. Okay, and all that corresponds to in its most simplistic format, 
a right line. That's saying go to the right in between those two fixed points. And then likewise, this negative output here says you're going to go to the left. You're going to go to the left. So from what everything we just studied, we can now classify 0, 50, and 1,000 as, you tell me, which one, which of these fixed points are the stable fixed points? Between the three fixed points, 0, 50, and 1,000, which fixed points are stable fixed points? Which fixed points are unstable fixed points? Don't worry, I'll back this all up using algebra on that side of the board, but I just like the pictures. I'll do the linear stability analysis over here next. And I'll wait to see what you share with me for classifications of the stability just by visualizing the phase line. Um, so now I'll go into linear stability analysis. Yeah, zero and a thousand are stable. Very good, very good. Right. So this is stable. This one is unstable. And this one is stable. Perfect. Okay, so um, we should be able to back that up with algebra. And um, the analysis that you see me do here is extremely valuable. I don't want to discount it because I didn't let it go first or because it's not visual. It's a very important type of analysis. The most important thing about linear stability analysis is that it scales up to higher dimensions. And how many dimensions can you visualize? That many? No, just three. Right. Me too. I can only visualize three dimensions. Once I get past the amount of dimensions that I can visualize in my head, this stuff isn't really going to work anymore. Right. But the algebra that I show you here works in n dimensions, where n is any number. It can work in a thousand dimensions. It can work in 10,000 dimensions. A lot of the technology that we use today with our streaming videos, with our facial recognition software, with our artificial intelligence, those are mathematical systems that have thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly even millions of dimensions. It also still works in that many dimensions. Okay, so we're going to understand that now, knowing that that is what really allows us to stretch into the um, higher order dimensions that we're no longer able to visualize. How linear? Oh, oh, another question for anyone who's still watching. And this actually is a concept quiz question. Okay, you're going to see this on your concept quiz. When I'm doing linear stability analysis, what am I analyzing? I'm about to write a derivative on the board. What derivative? Am I going to write? I'll give you a minute to tell me. What derivative am I about to write on the board? Oh man, am I gonna have to factor this sucker out? Ah, in order to take the derivative with the sweet derivative rules that I learned, I'm gonna have to factor it out. I'm gonna factor it out on the board while you answer my question of what derivative should I take once I have factored it out. Um, Instead of calling it n prime, I'd like to just call this f of n right now to make it easier for you to answer my question. What derivative am I about to write on the board? But first, I will factor this out in painstaking detail right in front of everybody, and I hope I won't screw up. Okay, n over 50 minus n squared over 50,000. Okay, uh, minus n over a thousand, uh, minus one, okay? And then I'm gonna combine these two terms together. <sighs> minus, I'm gonna move this term over here. Oops, 50,000. Uh, let's see, oh geez, what's one over 50 minus one over a thousand? Okay, I need a calculator. Um, keep trying to answer the question. <laughs> See me trying to. With one over fifty minus one over a thousand, internet, don't fail me now. Okay, zero point zero one nine. Um, so that's uh, plus zero point zero one nine n. 
minus one. I think I got it so far. If you're playing along, I'd appreciate any help you want to give me. Um, finally, last step, f of n. This is still just f of n. Is minus uh, n squared over. Now, point one is the same thing as because I guess fractions go down here. That's one tenth. So that's how I'm getting five hundred thousand on the bottom here, and then plus zero point oh oh one nine n minus oh squared uh, minus zero point one n. Oof, I did it, I typed it out, uh, factored it out. And what derivative am I going to take? Df dn, exactly, right. The derivative of f with respect to n. And this is not the same thing as the derivative of n with respect to t, okay? This is a very common misunderstanding. This is a really part of the class that we have to work hard to make sure we cement our understanding of right now. So for linear stability analysis, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do now find df dn, not dn dt. Okay, so we're gonna find df dn. We have to calculate df dn. We have to take the derivative of this expression with respect to its dependent variable, independent variable n. So f is depending on n, okay? And so we have to take this, we have to take the derivative, d is for derivative, I guess, derivative of f with respect to n. Actually, d is not for derivative, it's for um, differential. But anyway, I want you to understand that linear stability analysis relies on us taking the derivative of this with respect to n. It's not the same thing as taking dn dt. In fact, dn dt is, that's f of n, because remember f of n is equal to n prime? Well, n prime, n prime is dn dt. We already have dn dt. We don't need to find dn dt, we already have it, okay? That's not what we're doing, we're doing df dn. And that's also not the same thing as finding d squared and dt squared. We're not finding the second derivative of n with respect to time because we're not differentiating this expression with respect to time. We're differentiating this with respect to n. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do next. Sad that I'm going to have to erase my pretty picture to do that and replace it with, my, uh, with the algebra. But, uh, you know, you got to do what you got to do. This is important learning. This is what we're going to still be able to do in higher order dimensions. Um, however, in higher order dimensions, doing linear stability analysis will require the use of linear algebra. And so if anyone out there has seen linear algebra before, the equivalent of linear stability analysis for higher dimensions is the same thing as finding the eigenvectors of the corresponding matrix. Um, the corresponding Jacobian matrix evaluated at the fixed point. But don't worry about that part right now. But if we graphed it, wouldn't we see the stability in dn dt? Great question. Great question. Um, I will address the question that just got on the open chat space when I return to showing some graphs after I do this algebra. And I would love to help um, illuminate what we're seeing in the graph of n prime versus n and also in the graph of n versus t as we complete our analysis of the Ali effect, okay? First though, I will just show you taking the derivative of, actually, you know what, I'm gonna write it out in the other format because I want you to really know. I'm going to write df dn, okay? All right. Now, one more thing to say about this is whatever you're Ding on the bottom, like this is dn, that if you were thinking about how this would correspond to a tangent line on the graph, the type of graph that you would think about graphing to visualize this as a tangent line would be, this would be the horizontal axis and this would be the vertical axis. 
That's why this is going to correspond to the slope of a tangent line when we're looking at an F or N prime versus N graph. But it will not correspond to a tangent line on an X versus T graph because if T is the horizontal axis, then I would see a DT down here. Hopefully that makes a little sense. Remember that this derivative is the same thing as the slope equation ever was. It's rise over run. So F is the rise and N is the run. For us to interpret this as a slope, we would have to graph this on the Y and that on the X, okay? Okay, so just using our derivative rules on this line of junk right here, um, I'm gonna bring the two down. Uh, I'm gonna use a constant multiple rule here to uh, maintain the uh, 500,000 on the bottom. And then I'm gonna take the N and I'm gonna raise it to the first power. Oh, geez. Oh, boy, I really messed that up. That's supposed to be a cubed. You see, when I factor that through, n times n squared, that was supposed to be a cubed. My bad. Oh, where did the 0 0.19 come from? Thank you for asking me that. I had to type that into Google because um, you see when I was at this step here where I foiled out these two terms into a quadratic before factoring in the cubic term? So the four terms that come out of the foil will always have two that have to be combined, two like terms that are linear in nature. Here they are, n over 50 and minus n over 1,000. Now, what's 1 over 50 minus 1 over 1,000? I don't know. Type that into Google. Google told me 0 0.019. That's how I got that because it's 0 0.02 minus 0 0.001. That's how I got it. Thanks for asking. Okay, so anyway, um, yeah, I totally had uh, botched the uh, cubic term. <laughs> we know this is a cubic, okay? So we should have a cubic term. My bad. This n times this n squared leads that as a cubic. And so I have to bring the 3 down and leave the 2 up there. On the next term, I'm going to double this. Double the 19 is 38, so 0, 0, 0038 n to the first power, and then minus 0 0.1, and that linear term differentiates into the constant that was multiplying it. Make sure I get this all on the screen. Okay, good. So you see all that. So that's the derivative, okay? And um, we have three fixed points, and so to um, perform linear stability analysis, we will now evaluate the derivative uh, at each of the three fixed points. Bore, I sure hope that I can have some help from you all out there because um, we're going to have to do some number crunching right now. Um, so now what we're going to do is evaluate df dn at each equilibrium point. Get all that? Okay. Remember, there's three equilibria. There was n equals zero, so we're gonna evaluate df dn. And now I'll use the same notation in the book if you've been reading the book really carefully. Then you observed in chapter two where they introduced this long vertical bar and then a little number down there. That means the derivative evaluated at the point zero. This long bar here is a shorthand mathematical notation for evaluated at the point and then write the point that you're evaluating it at, at right under there, okay? Um, you could write it like that, and another way to say it would be df dn evaluated at, in functional notation, evaluated at zero. So either one of those ways works. Um, then we're gonna do df dn evaluated at 50, and we're gonna do df dn evaluated at 1,000, and all that means is we're just going to plug those numbers into that equation. So I need to have some help from the crew. Can somebody please help me type in the number 50 into this equation? And then somebody else, I don't know, choose amongst yourselves, help me type this equation, um, evaluate this equation using the number 1,000. Zero is going to be easy. I'll do that one in my head. But what happens when I plug in the number 50 for n here? What number do I get out? What happens when I plug in the number 1,000? 
I'm going to look for in the chat space. And when you do um, respond on the open chat space, could you please specify which value of n you have evaluated it at? That would be great if I can get your help with that. I'll do zero to start us off, and I will write out exactly what I'm doing. So you know what to do, too. I'm just going to plug in n equals zero. So I'm going to do minus 3, 0 squared, divided by 500,000, plus 0 0.0038 times 0, minus 0 0.1. Now I want you to do that for 50 and 1,000. You see, it's a little bit harder for those. Um, for this one, it's not so bad. I'm just going to move my thing a little bit more. It's just equal to minus 0 0.1. It's just equal to minus 0 0.1 there. So it's really not so bad. Anybody else? Sorry, I missed. Why are we using 50 and 1,000? Good question. We're using 50 and 1,000 and 0 because those are the three fixed points. Excellent question. Really important to know. Remember when we first analyzed this graphically um, and we thought, what are the fixed points? The roots of that cubic are 0, 50, and 1,000. You could have also gotten that by solving this is equal to 0 and setting each of the individual factors algebraically equal to 0. So 0 0.1n equals to 0 yields n is equal to zero. Setting this linear term right here, one minus n over a thousand equal to zero, gives us the fixed point n is equal to a thousand. And likewise, the zero for this factored term right here would be n is equal to 50. So at a thousand, we're getting negative 8.3. Thank you very much. So I didn't have to do that out. Hopefully you're getting a feel for what happens um, and how to get that. Um, Crunch that one out. They're points from the earlier question. Yeah, this is all the same question. We're still on exercise 3.2.8. This has been the same question the whole time. First, I hit it up graphically, and now I'm doing it. I'm tackling it with algebra now. Okay, great. Um, yeah, right, right. So what you have to do is first you have to find the zeros of the original f of n. Then you have to take the derivative and evaluate it at those zeros. That's how linear stability analysis goes. Did anybody happen to plug in the number 50 so that I can um, just write that one up on the board? If anybody else there can help me out with what's the evaluation at the number 50, that would be great too. And then we will go through what this means in terms of linear stability. Like, how does it get classified? While you're finishing that, um, hopefully this part allowed you to understand what I did. But now, so I can fit the classifications on the board, I'm going to erase the intermediate step, and I'm just going to give the output. OK, so that's what I got when I plugged in 0. Did anybody get an answer from when they plugged in? A uh, they got 0 0.075. Thank you. I really appreciate your help. Look, we're doing it together, even though we're on the internet. You see, we can still do this. 0 0.075, two people got it, fantastic, 0 0.075. Okay, now for the punchline. Okay, it was a lot easier to get the phase line than the punchline to this awful algebra joke, but we're gonna do it anyway. The punchline is that if the derivative dfdn evaluated at the fixed point is a positive number, that corresponds to an unstable fixed point. If the derivative evaluated at a fixed point is equal to a negative number, that fixed point is stable. Okay? So the punchline is this is a positive number. That means because I was evaluating it at the fixed point 50 and I got a positive number, I'm just telling you it's a positive number, it's greater than zero. 50 is unstable. That's my statement. Okay? This one is less than zero. So the punchline there is at the fixed point zero. Now for this one, I don't want you to confuse this zero with that zero, okay? These greater than or less than of zero, this is me just evaluating the sign. And this zero right here is literally the fixed point at which I evaluated the derivative. Uh, I think that's a little confusing. I don't want you to confuse. So I'm gonna write actually the words positive or negative. This is positive. 
And that's how I got that conclusion. This is negative. And so that's how I'm drawing. The conclusion is always drawn for the fixed point at which you evaluated it. And so because this is a negative number, the conclusion for zero is that it's stable. And then likewise, this is negative, less than zero. And so the conclusion here will be drawn for the equilibrium point at which I was evaluating the derivative, 1,000. And the conclusion is 1,000 is stable. If it's a negative number, it's stable. That's because of the linear system, x prime is equal to rx. See my first video in the playlist for this week where I talk about stability theory and I use the example x prime is equal to rx. If r is a negative number, it results in a stable equilibrium. If r is a positive number, it results in an unstable equilibrium. What we're doing with linear stability analysis is we're zooming in on a fixed point of the differential equation and we are squinting our eyes so that it looks like a linear system. The only linear system that's possible in one dimension is x prime is equal to rx. So each one of these is actually behaving just like x prime is equal to rx. So this one is going to be stable, unstable, and stable. Nice. Okay, yeah, and I, I just want you to know that although this seems like a double check for a beautiful graph that we had already done in higher dimensions, this is all we got, okay? So that's why this theory is extremely powerful, extremely useful. It just doesn't seem that way for one dimension, but it sure is pretty much the only thing you can do in higher dimensions. Um, even in starting in dimension two, it's a really useful tool because remember, the graph of n prime versus n this is a graph of a tangent space versus a state space. For one dimension, that's one cross one or two dimensions. For two dimensions, that's two cross two or four dimensions. So already in two dimensions, we will not be able to graph the beautiful graph that we saw before. I'm gonna bring it back to that graph for a minute because I want to honor the question that somebody put in. It was a really good question. If we graphed it, wouldn't we see the stability in dn dt? And this brings me back to my warm-up questions. How do we see the stability in terms of the n prime versus n graph? How do we see the stability in terms of the n versus t graph or the time series graph? I'm going to show both of those right now. Remember, we got two main types of graphs this week. That's really important. We have two main types of graphs. We have the n versus n prime graph. And the second type of graph is T and N right there, okay? Two types of graph. This is the graph of the derivative itself. Remember, N, that's the same thing as F of N versus N. And on that graph, we saw it looking like this. Remember? That was the cubic that we talked about, and we talked about how it corresponded to a phase lines. Uh, oh, uh, oopsies, my bad, I drew it wrong. It was the other way, I think, I drew, or wait, oh, I just drew the thing wrong. Okay, don't worry about it. So n prime versus n, it looked like this, right? And then it was like this. Yeah, looked like that, right? So here was the stable 1,000. Here is the unstable 50. Here is a zero. Remember how I just went through all this junk over here? And I got these three numbers, negative 0 0.1, 0 0.075, and negative 8.3. Let me show you what those numbers are on this graph. Red pen, I'm going to draw tangent lines. If I'm going to draw tangent lines on a graph where the y is n prime and the x or the horizontal axis is n, that means those tangent lines are going to be representing the rise over run, which is df dn, right? That's because this is the same thing as f of n, okay? So on this graph, because the rise is f and because the run is n, right here on this graph, tangents on this graph are representing df dn. Okay, because the rise on this graph is f, 
and the run on this graph is n. So any kind of linear approximation that I do resulting in a tangent line will be a representation of rise over run, f over n. And there's your three tangent lines. Hopefully you can see those. Maybe I'll exaggerate them a little bit more. Again, they're not to scale, but what they are is there are graphical representations of these three slopes that we just calculated, okay? So at the point zero, we have a tangent line whose slope looks like minus 0 0.1. So at the point zero right here, the slope of that tangent line looks like negative 0 0.1, okay? At the point 50 right here, the slope, or the DFDN, looks like the positive value 0 0.075. Okay, and finally, at this tangent line right here, the slope looks like negative 8.3. So if you had drawn this on Desmos and you had zoomed in on these equilibria, it would look much more to scale, which is to say that this would have a much steeper negative slope than uh, that one over there. And this would have a really, really shallow negative slope because the slope's negative, the slope is positive 0.075. Okay, so that's what those, that's what these numbers from this side of the board have interpreted as on this graph. They don't have the same interpretation on this graph. If I was gonna look at this graph, tangents on this graph would look like, would be representations of dn dt, because that's what the rise over run on this graph would be. Okay, so let me just finish this up by drawing the time graph. Do you remember what the equilibria should look like on this graph? I have three equilibria, and I wanna hear from you again. For the three equilibria, zero and 50 and 1,000, what am I gonna draw on this graph for each one of those equilibria? What should I draw? You tell me. And while you're thinking about it, I'm just going to go over and see what else we have because I see that this is, um, as usual, running over time, but uh, hopefully very much of value to everybody. So we will keep going. I'm skipping over number 12 because it's the same problem again. And next request was number 10. Oh, goodness me. Okay, so we do have time for that. We'll do number 10. And then number two. We can do that really quick, and uh, and then we'll do further number 10. Okay. The rest of them, I'll, I'll try to hit them up, and I'll try to maybe go a little bit faster, hoping that in these first exercises you've really gained a lot of understanding. Horizontal lines. Yes. That's another question on your concept quiz. I said it. Okay. That's why we go through Thursdays before, probably before you submit the quiz, is what do equilibrium points look like on a time series? Horizontal lines. Right. So I'm going to draw three horizontal lines, one for each height. Okay. So the zero one is going to just overlay on the time graph. This is n equals zero. There's going to be one right here, n equals 50. And then there's going to be one to scale. That would be way up here, and n equals 1,000. Three horizontal lines on a time series graph for the three equilibrium points. And so with that, I want to emphasize the fact that you're not really seeing these numbers that we got out of linear stability theory as slopes on this graph because these three lines have a zero for their slope. That's, by definition, what equilibrium is. It's a place where dn dt is always equal to zero, right? The slopes are what we were looking at the other graph for. Okay, and then other solutions to the graph. Um, for example, if I started, like maybe I started here with like 100 for my population, the phase line tells me I would approach 1,000. And what that looks like on a time graph is I would approach 1,000 like this. I would never actually touch it. I would just be exponentially decaying, approaching. I would be approaching equilibrium at a rate that appears to be exponential decay because as I approach this equilibrium point, the differential equation itself appears to be linear. 
and the solution to linear differential equations is exponential growth or decay. That's so beautiful. I hope you think that's beautiful. Like I, I've been spending my whole adult life on this stuff, and I tell you, it never gets old for me. I just love it. Um, okay, I'll stop. So anyway, one more thing I want to interpret for you. Remember when we talked about this peak? This peak being like the place where the rate of change, dndt, is at its greatest because this is the, the output here represents dndt. So wherever this peak is right here represents the place that is the inflection point on this. Because if you remember from pre-calculus, inflection points are the locations on a graph where the rate of change is highest. Okay, and so you can see that we have kind of a slow on-ramping. When we start on a solution that's near 50 but a little bit above it, remember the vector field will be small and then it'll get bigger and bigger. And it'll be big and it'll get smaller and then it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So let me show you what how these arrows that I just drew interpret as the um, tangents on this graph because remember, tangents here Tangents on this graph here are, again, rise over run every time. So dn dt. So tangents on this type of graph are dn dt. That's why dn dt equals zero for all those horizontal lines. And you can see that if I travel through and I look at the tangents, the tangents are getting steeper and steeper and steeper still. And then they start to level off and they get less steep, right? They get less steep. So right here is a place where the tangent is steepest. Where the tangent is steepest is the value of n that corresponds to this biggest black arrow that corresponds to this vertex point on that graph there. That's how they're related. Is it because it never meets equilibrium on the time graph that includes time explicitly that we don't match that one out and instead do the derivative? to find those numbers. Um, thanks for the comment. I'm trying to understand what you mean. Not sure if I get it at first glance. We don't to the derivative. I, I guess I don't really mean when the comment says, um, is that why we don't math that one out? I kind of love the way that you wrote that, but I'm not sure what you mean by math it out. Um, probably going to start saying that now. So when we do the stability theory, what we're trying to do is we're trying to classify whether things will be approaching those fixed points, right? Remember how I said the approach of another solution, of a nearby solution towards this is one that looks like exponential decay, or if they're going to be diverging away from it, because you'll notice that if I choose a an initial condition that's near this unstable fixed point, what it's going to look like is it's going to look like exponential growth away from that fixed point. You see how this, if you zoom in right here, that looks like exponential growth away from it, and that's because that's an unstable fixed point. I'm not sure if that super helps, but I hope it helps a little. Um, I should move on. It's uh, 15 after 2, so... I know this one's gonna keep, this is gonna be a long one, but uh, I'm glad to see people still watching and I should move on. I think we're gonna do 3.2.10 and then we'll catch up with further exercise number two. And I think that'll be it for the day. So if you move on to 3.2.10 on page 123, it gives you a system where it says x prime is equal to 2x squared minus x. And it says, perform a linear stability analysis. What's the character of this point? And then do all this test point stuff and blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine, I will, but not before I draw a graph because I really love to see graphs. So for number 3.2.10, I'll be drawing a graph first. Thank you very much. So that I can visualize what you're asking me to calculate with algebra. Sorry, I had to move on. I don't know if I really was able to help you with that last comment, but um, it's kind of getting on. And kind of supposed to be somewhere at three, but we'll see if that happens.
Again, so 3.2.10. X prime is equal to 2x squared minus x. Okay, I'm drawing a picture. I got to see it to believe it, okay? So I'm going to my go-to picture, which is the x versus the x prime graph. And I know I'm going to be graphing an up-facing parabola. One of the roots is zero, and the other root is going to be at a half. Let me just factor this out so I can see it. 2x minus 1. Hopefully you can appreciate how this factors out by pulling an x out. And the reason that I did that is if I want to find the equilibrium points, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the right-hand side of the Diffie Q equal to zero, and then I'm going to pull down the two factors, and I'm going to separately set both of those factors equal to zero. That's why I chose to factor it out. So either x is equal to zero or 2x minus 1 is equal to zero, and that yields x is equal to 1 half. Sure, sure, I'm willing to do some algebra, especially if it aids my ability to graph. So I wanted to graph this up-facing parabola, but I need to know its roots first. So there, I found its roots really quick. Here's one, here's the other one and a half, and I know it's an up-facing parabola, so it looks like that. Okay, negative, move to the right. Negative, move to the left. Positive, move to the right. Can everybody see which fixed point is stable and which fixed point is unstable? That's the name of the game, and we're pretty much there with the picture. But again, let's go through the steps of linear stability analysis. This is much simpler than the last equation, so it won't be nearly as much of a headache. But before we even do that, you tell me, which fixed point is stable, zero or a half? Which fixed point is unstable, zero or a half? And then I'm going to make some room for linear stability analysis on the other board there. in which I'm going to take df dx, where this is defined as f of x. No takers on that one? You don't want to classify the fixed points for me? OK, I'll leave it as an open question. I won't release the answer there, because I'm wondering if any, anybody. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. I know. We've been in here a long time. But you hang in there. I'll hang in there, too. Exactly. Zero is stable and half is unstable. Exactly. Awesome sauce. So this one is stable and this one is unstable right here. Right. You got it. And now let's match that up with linear stability analysis. We're here. That's our f of x it is 2x squared minus x. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what the derivative of that is? That's much simpler than the other one. So this really isn't going to be as, as elaborate as a problem as the last one. But that's why we went through the calculus in the last chapter, is so that we can take derivatives of functions like this and uh, go ahead and calculate the derivative. And then after you've calculated the derivative, what we're going to do next is we're going to evaluate df dx, evaluate it at 0. And then we're going to take df dx. And we're going to evaluate it at a half. Evaluate it at a half. 4x minus 1. You got it. Right. That wasn't so bad, right? We didn't even have to factor it out. 4x minus 1. Right. The 2 comes down and multiplies that 2 to bring me to a 4. 2 minus 1 is 1. x to the 1. And... The derivative of the linear term is just the coefficient in front, which is minus 1. Now let's just plug in 0. So 4 times 0 minus 1. That's minus 1. Oh, look, minus 1, that's less than 0. That's why it's stable. Okay? 4 times a half to do the other fixed point, minus 1, is 2 minus 1, and that's positive 1. Okay? So without it even having looked at the graph, you would be able to classify the fixed points as stable and unstable. 
But why ignore such beauty when you can actually look at the graph in one dimension? This is special about one dimension. Don't get spoiled. Um, what I just did is I calculated the slope on the tangent line for this fixed point. The m is equal to minus 1. And then I calculated the slope of the tangent line on this fixed point. And for that, the m was equal to positive 1. That's what we just did. Maybe we should have done this one before the LE effect because that was a lot easier. But that's what they wanted you to do there. Um, Oh, look at this. Oh, wait, there's a part B. Oh, let's talk a little bit about the part B. So in part B, I just did part A. Part B, it says, let's try a test point analysis. Oh, yeah, we learned the method of test points. Right, okay. Um, let's choose minus 1 and 1 for our test points. Well, the change vector at minus 1 is 3, and the change vector at plus 1 is 1. Wait a minute, those both have the same sign. That I thought they were. I thought they were supposed to have different signs when we evaluate on either side of the point. Now I'm confused. So what the heck is going on in Part B? Does anybody want to leave a comment about what they see as Part B? What's going on there? Is if we tried out some test points. So for Part B here. So in Part B, it says use test points. X is equal to minus one and x is equal to 1. Let me just graph where those test points would literally be on the graph. So x is equal to minus 1 is somewhere over here, and x is equal to positive 1 is somewhere over there. And in part b, what they're saying is, is I'm just going to extend the parabola a little bit. If you evaluate the vector field at minus 1, you get a positive number. If you evaluate the vector field at positive 1, you also, extending the parabola more, you also get a positive number. So what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Well, the method of test points tells us that one side's supposed to be positive and the other one's supposed to be negative or vice versa. They're not supposed to have the same sign, right? But um, these are both coming out positive. It's because our test points are too far apart. The method of test points relies on you getting really close to one fixed point and testing on either side of just one fixed point. Or over here, I would test on either side of this fixed point. But those two test points are way too far away from each other. And using minus 1 and 1 as test points is actually surrounding more than one fixed point. Right. But we are looking on different sides of two equilibrium points. Right. That's a major problem. In the method of test points, you're only supposed to have one equilibrium point between the two test points. That's the problem. The issue is using the method of test points we should only have one equilibrium point between the two test points. Now don't just copy that straight to your homework. You can say that in your own words. But that was the problem for part B. That's the issue. And you got it. Somebody put that right in the chat. Great. Um, uh, we need to wrap this up. So I'm going to go for further exercise number two. Uh, further exercise number 10. Boy, I'd love to do that one too. Eh. Okay. I'm going to do further exercise number two super fast because I want to get to further exercise number 10. That's... um kind of a, a, a look-ahead type of question. So I really want to do that. But for number two, I am going to just do the same thing that I just did here, but now in double speed because you all have now gone through it several times. Okay, so in number two, if you flip to page 131, you see that we're given a state equation for P prime, um, which P is the fraction of mice that have the new gene. 
a study of genetic mutation in a population of mice. And it says find the fixed points, right? If 10% of mice, if it starts with 10%, what is it going to go to in the long run? If it starts with 90%, what is it going to go to in the long run? Great question. All things that we can answer with that same beautiful graph, P prime versus P. Okay, same thing that we had done so many times before. And I, I feel like you must be hopefully getting the hang of it here for another exercise 3.2.2. Right, we're gonna just uh, graph it out. We're, we're gonna find the fixed points, we're gonna graph it out. We're gonna do P versus P prime. Okay, so let's find those equilibrium points. Okay, um, you know what? I feel like at this point, I know that you can do a lot of this, and so I, I wanna stop giving away so much. I'm gonna kind of talk through it, but I'm gonna leave some open holes here because I want, I don't want to steal all your work. Like this is hopefully starting to feel like fun for you, and I don't want to give it all away. So I'm just gonna give you a, um, a little bit less this time than what I had given before. Okay. I'm gonna give you that. That's kind of what it looks like. Where's the fixed points? Not gonna say. Do you know how to find the equilibrium points? We have factored it out, right? So set each one of the three factors separately equal to zero, and you will locate the three fixed points that you see that I've graphed here. I know that the graph looks roughly cubic. If I wanted to know exactly how it looked, I would be free to just type this in on Desmos, and I encourage you to do that because that really does help. So go ahead and just type that function into Desmos using x as the variable instead of p, and you'll see something that looks uh, roughly like that. It's got three fixed points, which you can find algebraic. And then I'm just gonna, you know, kind of explore my little thing that I do. Like this is negative, negative. This is positive, positive, negative, positive, right? And so you're supposed to, uh, oh, it says just find the equilibrium and determine the stability. It doesn't tell you to go through stability theory. So if you don't want to do the linear stability analysis, you don't have to do the algebra, but you can classify them yourself. Again, I, I'm kind of hesitant to give it away. I want you to practice. And then I'll just address the two questions a little bit. The first question says, if 10% of mice have the new gene, what fraction will they have in the long run? Second question is, if 90% of the mice have the new gene, what will they go to in the long run, okay? And so a question like that, we will answer same way with just the graph, right? So if we start with 10%, that means, like the book says, that P is equal to 0 0.1, okay? So if, if our starting initial condition is P is equal to 0 0.1, Here's where 0 0.1 is on the graph. Where do you think it's going to go? It's going to just follow the direction of what the differential equation tells us to do. And so it's going to go to the right, and it's going to move toward the right more and more. And then once it gets here, it has to stop. That's the thing about equilibrium. You have to stop. You can't go past that. That's just the infinite stop sign. Never going to get past that. So what's going to happen is it's going to tend toward this point. What exactly is that point's value? Mum's the word. I'm not going to say this time. I'll save it for you. Um, same thing with 90%. That would be 0 0.9. That's going to be over here somewhere. And then you're going to follow what it tells you to do. Once you hit a fixed point, you got to stop. Okay, that's all I'm giving away for that one. 
because it's kind of what we've been practicing for this session. But now I will talk a little bit about further exercise number 10. And uh, that's the last of it. I wonder how many people are still actively walking. If you are, you are a math marathon runner today because we're almost at the two hour mark for this. And that's after your Zoom sessions. So you get a little pat on the back if you're still watching um, and you're actually still <laughs> trying to play along right now. I would say I'm impressed. Okay, let's just talk about number 10, further exercise 3.2.10, and that's the question of the semi-stability. Okay. okay. So, when we run through this, same thing that we've been doing each time, each and every time, if I have a one-dimensional autonomous system, I know exactly what to do. Yay, you're still here. Woo, me too, here too. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, maybe in the future I can uh, tap out with my husband. He actually is an applied mathematician too. We both got our PhDs together. So he could do this for you too, but um, I'm having a good time still. So. I'm graphing X prime versus X. That's how we connect. See, we both... We talk about differential equations all the time. It's adorable. Um, oopsies. Let me graph that a little bit. I'm, I've been sticking to the first quadrant a little too much. For this problem, I kind of want to draw your classic, classic uh, thing like that. You see, I've usually been emphasizing the first quadrant because we were talking about um, population dynamics. But for this, I'm just going to do the general xy plane here. But I'm still graphing x versus x prime. And x squared, that's an easy one. That's just my classic parabola, x squared right there. We're going to do the same thing that we've been doing, which is arrows. Okay? If the graph is above, we're going to draw arrows to the right. If the graph is, oh, it's still above. Okay, so I'll still draw to the right. And that's what, just like the book says, that results in... A semi-stable equilibrium point. Ah, oh, really? It's just semi-stable. You see, it has both sides of the coin. It has stable going in, and then it has unstable going out. So it's a combo. Semi-stable at uh, for the equilibrium point x equals zero. Does anybody know what would happen if I tried to do linear stability theory on this fixed point? We haven't even seen what linear stability theory tells us when, when we're working with a semi-stable. We've been just doing it for stable and unstable. I wonder what linear stability theory would tell me for this one. Hmm. Okay. Well, it, it doesn't actually say to do that but I think it's a good exercise to go through. Um, here again x prime is the same thing as saying f of x. So x prime equals f of x and I just like to name it so that as you see me going through the linear stability analysis you know that I'm doing df dx and that's equal to 2x and then df dx Evaluated at the fixed point zero. Ah, oh. yes, the x is equal to zero. I don't know what to do. Remember how linear stability analysis told me that if this number comes out positive, it's unstable, and if this number comes out negative, it's stable. For semi-stable cases, it comes out as zero, and in that case, we call it a big fat fail. Fails. Yep, just like a classic internet fails here. It's not going to tell me. It, it's. I can't tell you it's stable because it's not negative. I can't tell you it's unstable because it's not positive. And exactly the reason why this happens is it looks like this. It's intersecting the x-axis with a horizontal tangent line, right? Because remember, if a derivative equals zero, that corresponds to a horizontal tangent line. Okay, so semi-stable, semi-stable equilibrium points have 
horizontal tangent. And by that, I'm talking about the x prime versus x graph. So what I mean is df dx, not dx dt, but df dx is equal to zero. Okay, and for that, we say linear stability theory fails. Okay. Um, because it is truly, it's neither stable nor unstable. So it's right to fail on that case, because I wouldn't put my money on stable or unstable, because you can see we got a mix of both here. Now, what it says here is um, let's consider an alteration where we're going to add a parameter plus A, and we're going to let A, we're going to let A translate the graph vertically up and down, okay? So that, when we start to talk about the action of parameters and the effect of parameters on the location and stability of equilibrium points, that is the heart of bifurcation theory. We will be learning that um, around week eight in section 3.6. This is a really nice look ahead. So I will show you one bifurcation right now. One of our most classical examples of a bifurcation is simply a vertical translation of a parabola up and down. Okay, so I'm just gonna draw that again, but just make some room for the new things I'm about to say. So here is uh, x squared, right? But now we're talking about x squared plus a. See my optional video, logistic model with harvesting, in which we're gonna basically be doing the same, a similar type of analysis. We're gonna take a quadratic function, in that case it's a down facing one, and we're gonna vertically translate it up and down. Ecologically speaking, that is um, presenting harvesting, a constant harvesting um, per unit time of population. Let's get some pretty colors going on here. So I will draw you two different pictures, one for a positive value of A and one for a negative value of A. Okay, let's say that A is equal to one. If a is equal to 1, this would be the function x squared plus 1, okay? So that's the case where a is equal to 1. Remember, a is the thing that I'm using to vertically translate this up or down. If a is equal to minus 1, this would be the function x squared minus 1. So that's the case where a is equal to minus 1. Can you see that? Good. Okay. These are three qualitatively different cases of a behavior of a system as I alter the parameter A to be different than zero. If I use any positive value of A, you see the parabola gets lifted above the x-axis. There are no longer any intersections. There are no longer any fixed points for the blue line. If I use a negative value of A, that's gonna pull the parabola down. And then there's going to be more than one. Remember, the black line just had the one intersecting point. So for the green case, there's two fixed points. Okay? So for a is equal to minus one, we have f of x is equal to x squared minus one. And we have two equilibrium points, which are located at x is equal to plus and minus one. Okay? And then in the blue case here, when a is equal to plus one, our f of x is equal to x squared plus 1. And in the blue case, there are no equilibrium points, right? And in the black case that we just went through, the black case, there's one equilibrium point. And so what a bifurcation is, is a bifurcation is a sudden change in the qualitative behavior of a differential equation. Um, so what I mean by that is that qualitative behavior means that like there's some kind of quality. Like what kind of quality am I talking about? How about the number of fixed points some equation might have? Okay, that's just a quality. Like I'm not trying to tell you exactly where those fixed points are. I just want to say there's two of them or there's one of them or there's none of them. If we change from a case where there's two fixed points and it has a quality of two fixed points, to a case where there's just one single fixed point. We went from two to one. And then if we go up higher, it goes to zero fixed points. So it goes from two to one to zero. That's a qualitative change in behavior. And that's what we're gonna call bifurcation. What does the book want me to do again? 
All right, for each value of A, determine the stability. Well, we already did that for the black line. It was semi-stable. For the green line, I know you can handle that. So I'm not going to classify the stability for the green line because I know you can do it. For the blue line, there's no, there's no um, fixed points to do, so there's nothing to do. Explain why semi-stable equilibria rarely occur in real life. Ooh, that's a good one. I almost don't want to answer that because I'm so interested to see what you would answer. Um, I don't know how much energy you got left in you. We're nearing the two-hour mark. But if anybody wants to throw in an answer for question 10C, why do you think semi-stable equilibria rarely occur in real life? Why do you think that? I'm going to give you a minute, and then we're going to close it out with this. Okay, this is part C. For that answer, I would like to um, maybe kind of write down the qualities I was describing here. So for the blue one, I was saying that we have the case of zero equilibrium points, and that's when A is greater than zero. Okay, for the green one, I said we had two equilibrium points, and that's when a is less than zero. Okay, and the black one was the case where we had one semi-stable equilibrium point. This is the semi-stable case here. Semi-stable. When, and that was when A is equal to zero. Kind of trying to hint at the answer to part C here. Without saying it, thanks for contributing. I'm really impressed that you're still here. You're still engaging. That's awesome. Um, it says, if it's semi-stable, it's a fine line between instability. Right. It's a fine line. I love the way you said that. I'm so glad I didn't um, say anything until I heard from you. And someone else says, it's line up so that A is exactly zero. And there's one semi-stable equilibrium point. I'm so happy that you're still here. And those are great answers. Saying things like it's a fine line between these two categories, you're exactly right. You see, the blue happens for a bunch of different A, like A less than zero. There's tons of A's that are less than zero. The green happens, oh, sorry, there's tons of A's that are greater than zero for the blue. Likewise, for the green, which happens when A is less than zero, there's tons of values of A that can be less than zero. That's all the negative numbers. But when does the black one happen? That's the semi-stable case. It's a fine line. It's the dividing line between these two cases. It only happens for the one value of A, the one special value, when A is equal to zero. So that's why people are using words like fine line and exceptionally rare. And A is equal to zero is only one situation of an infinitely large number of A. You all three of you got it right, and you did a great job staying till the very end. We have 10 more seconds until we've been doing this for two full hours. So bravo to you for paying attention. Maybe we have some budding mathematicians in the mix there. And uh, thank you for staying. Those are great answers to the question. And uh, I hope that you got a lot out of today's session. I'll see you later. Good luck finishing the homework.